first grade lit, we are reviewing for tomorrow's test. Any other questions about literary terms? Literary terms. I would say the conclusion. Oh, not the demon. It's not the demon. No, that's the demon. Convince me that I'm wrong. It's conclusion. Uh, it says on the other sheet that the. Uh, I, I want to get it right. I'm not sure what I told you. The dumont is when the book and plot is resolved or explained. So I guess I can actually give you credit for both because they're, they're both probably true, but I couldn't remember what I told you. I thought it was just like what the... I thought it was? It's like the downhill after the It is. Um, but it's also true that those, some of those problems get resolved. They don't get all resolved in the last act, which is true. Any other literary... No. Yeah. Yes. Um, an arrangement of a sentence in which items of equal importance are written in a similar grammatic, uh, grammatical form. Parallel, parallelism. We're going to do an exercise on that because I think it's an important skill to know, and I know that Maples has probably done some with you, um, but you can't get too much of it. It's, it's not theoretical. It's very practical. You can use it, Sean. Uh, <clears throat> descriptive, la descriptive language that evokes the senses. Uh, what do you think it is? Imagery. Yeah. If you if you have to define imagery, if you leave the senses out, and you can say five senses because that's how many we have, I, I can't give you full credit for that because that's the important thing about it. It opens up your understanding of what imagery is when you realize that it what a description does, it appeals to sight, sound, smell, taste, and sight. So when you see it, um, you've got images. Yeah. Um, is paranormalia attention rhetoric students? Please pardon the interruption for quick announcement. All high school boys basketball players need to meet Coach Bo in the gym at the break at 2 10. So all boys high school basketball players meet Coach Bo in the gym would you ask your question then? Oh, never mind. Let me ask well, what, read it so they can. Yeah. Uh, Paranomasia is a play on words. Is that correct? Right. And we, we can have an example. Because we, we read it yesterday. I think you did. What is it? Uh, he was going to steal. You know, he was going to steal. You know, you know, Ben, you have a pretty good mind. You really do. You remember things pretty well. Um, yeah, I'm talking to you. Um, and uh, you need to make sure you use it because it's good. Um, you do remember things that I didn't think other, you know, most people might not remember. Um, but you, you certainly got to listen. But I'm, I'm impressed. Good. So. Good. I think it was Lily yesterday. I thought I didn't mention you by name. I might have. She she was answering some questions, and I made a point to tell you, and I told some of the other classes. You know how she listened. She she didn't know that just because she's smart. You, you can't you can be smart still not know anything. Um, but she was listening, and that's 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 the key right there. Good job. Yeah. Oh, this isn't on here, but what's the plot? What is the definition? You know, plot. What's like the plot of the story? Okay, the plot of the story is from scene one to the last scene in the play. So. What you need to do is just somehow in your mind review each act. I think if you wrote down or thought about what happens in each act, like what happened, first act, there are two things that happen. Really, one thing that happened. He's persuaded by the bishops to fight France and he gets the tennis balls and he comes up with that speech in the back one. And I get a little fuzzy when you get to act two and three. Act four, I know really well. Um, but it would help be helpful if you could delineate what happens in each act. Um, we're not going to go over that unless you have a question. Is this said? Can we move on? Um, yes. What's the difference between uh, what made Henry a good leader and was he? Wait, wait, wait. 
that's a, the topic at the end. Let's go to the Shakespeare part, and then we'll go to the topic. Yeah. Name two places where plays were performed before Shakespeare's death. Yeah, part. Um, at a court or a university hall. All right, anywhere there's space, and it's helpful if it's inside. But I, I, I think about where we're standing right now. If you look out the window, you got a building on the other side. To the right, you got a building, and to the left, you got part of a building. That's how court. That's what makes a courtyard is that space between buildings, um, and that's that was a great place. In fact, if you think about it, that that's the was probably the in, um, inspiration for the Globe Theater. Think about it, the Globe Theater. Um, you've got galleries where people sit. You got a yard where people stand, and you got a stage where people act. And that's why they use spaces like this, because people could sit or stand up here and watch it, um, and they could stand on the ground and watch it. So, um, remember, we don't, have a, we don't have a theater. We're using just a room. Um, we've used all sorts of things, and rarely have we ever used a theater, certainly not here, because we don't have one. Yeah? Uh, what are some characteristics of the Grove Theater? I just... I literally just mentioned it oh, yeah. right now. The fact that it has galleries where people can look down on the play and sit with a roof over them. They have a yard where people can stand and watch the stage. You also need to think about what that stage looks like. It's got a structure at the back, the Tyrion House. Yeah. Um, it's got, you know, and what those different parts of that Tyrion House no, or Tyrion House is used for. There's another thing. Hazelnut. Well, that was, that was just a little interesting. It was the popcorn of the day. And so uh, it was a, an effort to get you to realize this was a, uh, a form of entertainment that, that we associate now with college, colleges and fancy places, but average people went to see Shakespeare. Uh, yeah. Um, what was the ceiling of the stage platform? The heavens. Yeah. When was Henry the Fifth written? Then? 1599. What year was Shakespeare born? 1564. Anybody know the day? April 23rd. April 23rd. It's like almost a month Yeah. Um, uh, that's the word is. Um, were the people who was like stood in the yard called groundlings? Yeah. Yeah. What was this uh, acting company of Richmond Hall? Yeah. Um, I know that one it was what it had something to do with like the Lord Chamberlain. Yeah, the Lord but there Chamberlain. were two names. That, that was that's that what he's asking for. King's uh, man. The king, the king's man later. How many plays he write? Sixty. Yeah. I don't know if it's a question, but how many sonnets did he write? Hundred and fifty. It isn't a question, but um, meters. He wrote a couple of uh, long poems that I've never read, and I always say I'm going to. I never remember to. Um, so there are other things other than plays, but he primarily known for plays. All right, so look look at the uh, discussion topics. It's in an exhaustive list. There are um, two, there are two others that we can also add to it. The first two are basically the same, so we'll put that together. What what makes a good king, and how is Henry a good king? Um, Libby, can you give me one? thing that makes Henry a good king. Uh, and you could argue, and some people have, that he's not a good king. So are you mind moving back a little bit? No, I just get up and move. Can you think of a can you think of something that makes him a good king? So he could relate, that's one important 
important reason he could relate, relate to his troops, which means, give me a specific example, when did he go out? Uh, well, yeah, that, that's actually a good example. The night before the battle, remember, he goes out, and then somebody pointed out that he actually fights with him. He doesn't sit on a horse in the rear of the army. He, uh, that's probably not smart for your king to be on the front lines, but he does. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, that would be one reason. Sarah? Um, he would do what you said. He would do, like, when you said that he would hang any, anyone that stole from the French, anyone who's Yeah, so he's, he's fair. He's, he's just. He has a rule. He doesn't have two rules. One for his friends and one for everybody else. It's the same rule. Give me another one. Um, he's wise and cautious, but he's also very assertive in his leadership. So, like, um, when he was deciding whether or not to go to war with France, he was, like, talking about it and discussing it instead of just going for it. And But he didn't want to just lay over on his stomach. He wanted to, like, assert his leadership. Uh, so he asked the bishop... Remember, he even cautioned him. He said, be careful what you tell me, because if you're wrong, I don't want to go over there and fight what's not a just war. And so they probably do lie to him at some point. You know, one thing is not on any of these. I don't know if it's too late to add it, because I didn't mention it, but the, uh, remember the, uh, the Salic Law? That'd be a great extra credit. Well, can you pay attention in here? All right. We'll see. Um, the salad claw would be a good one. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say the law. What was it? Oh, uh, it was like where it was where it, the king doesn't have like all the power. Right? Not really. No. Oh. Become king if you claim your claim runs through your mother's side of the family. Uh, I don't know how many points we had, but that's not enough. Uh, you need three or four. That's a couple of good ones to get started with. There are other things that you could say. One thing um, that I would hope you would talk about is his skill with language. Think of how many times he uses his words to uh, scare the governor of Harfleur uh, into surrendering or uses his words to win Catherine over to marry him or uses his words to inspire uh, 12,000 men to fight 60,000 men. Um, so he, he uses his words to insult the Dauphin. So he's really good at speaking. Um, and I think, you know, good kings should be. They have to be. Are there others... Uh, so 45 and 46 go together. So what are the qualities of leadership that makes him a good king? If you wanted to argue why he's a good king, you probably could do that too. You could probably find some things. But Shakespeare doesn't give you a lot to work with because in reality, he may have not been a great king, you know, the greatest. He had more flaws. Shakespeare just doesn't show those to you. Um, all right, so let's, there, there are at least four more. We've, we've got enough time to look at it. We talk about the St. Crispin speech, and if I asked you this, you would need to quote specific lines, which you know, at least you know 30 lines of it. Um, so anytime you make a claim about that speech, you would need a line to back it up. So what makes it an effective speech is certainly one of the most famous speeches he ever wrote, that is Shakespeare ever wrote. What makes it effective? Give me one reason. Um, it's effective because he's like saying, uh, like if you fight with me, like when you go home, like you're gonna be like a hero and like you'll be my brother for like the rest of my life. Do you remember a lot, a specific line that backs that up? Um, like when you like go, say, if you come safe home, like you'll be like roused like a tiptoe and this day is like name. So, what does that prove? Uh, that like when you go home, you're gonna be a hero. So you should fight with me today because you're, this is, you're going to be a legend when this thing is over. Yes? And he talked about how men who didn't come would like not be honorable and would not be very proud. He said that um, Englishmen now have been like more honorable than they were in the past. 
really good point. The opposite of that is true. Those that weren't here uh, will be ashamed of themselves. You got one? Uh, yeah. Like at the beginning of the speech, and then um, when he's talking about, uh, but when he's it's like he's basically saying that even if we die trying, at least the people know that we like tried to help them, kind of. And then if we go home, we think they're honored. Well, in other words, there's glory in it. I think I can get that much out of what you just said. Um, and uh, in several places you could quote, what would be a good place to quote that would support that? That there is glory here. Right? Yes. It's like the, um, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. And like that when they all, like when you're with their neighbors and stuff, they're going to have their own day. And then they can like trust that you honor them. So peace yeah. to the vigil. All right, good. Um, Wish not one man more, and, and remember the fewer men, the greater share of honor. He makes a negative, with, we're out numbered five to one, into a positive. Listen, we don't even need this man. Some of you, if you don't want to be here, go home. I'd rather, I'd rather not, I'd rather not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship than die with us. That will pay your way home. I, I don't want to see you if if you can't give me your best today. Um, so. I'm going to require that you use um, verses or lines from the play. If you say something, I hope the verse supports it. So you've got to, you've got to put to use what you've memorized. Um, there are three more. All right, only one here, but there are two on the other sheet. So I don't think we need to do this because we've done it. We, we talked about it yesterday. So the contrasting scenes thing, uh, please study that. Remember the comic relief how two opposites bring out each. So that's what you're looking for. Um, you're looking for two opposite scenes back to back that are so opposite that they stand out. You don't, you don't, didn't this scene just do what they did in the last scene? No, that's, it's different, yet it's also the same. So, um, and remember comic relief. Some scenes are there, they're opposite. The sad scene, the difficult scene, and then followed by a humorous scene. Even in the battle, after the battle's over, the same scene, Henry conducts this practical joke on um, Luke's, uh, Fluellen and William. And that's supposed to bring kind of a comic relief to this. Um, yes? Are we going to have to have an example for like couplet and like. I, I think I already mentioned that. I, I, I probably won't have, you won't have time to do that, but knowing both might help you get it right. Okay. Sometimes if you give an example, uh, it's better than the definition because, you know, it's practical. All right, the two others that are on the other sheet, uh, one is, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, all right, so one of those, oh, Henry's past life. Um, Taylor, can you help us out with that one? What, what's his past life? Why is that a factor in this play? Say that again. Right. How does that become a factor in the play? Um, well, like How does that, that youthful past, even though he's not that way anymore, how does it still continue to haunt him, Libby? It shows how he developed and matured over the time. Yes, but how does it still sort of is a problem for him, that he has this reputation? Well, because then people expect little of him, and they don't think he can, like, measure up to the good. Maybe if the Dolph fan had, tr had respected, were you going to say that? But it, I, I'd say that there's an argument on both sides. I mean, you guys have a reputation, whether you realize it or not, and to have a not so good reputation just makes it harder for you. People aren't gonna, if you don't wanna be not taken seriously, um, and that, that be, you know, he has to, he has to, maybe the king would have given in to him, the king of France, uh, if, he, if Henry hadn't had such a, a 
bad reputation. You're right, it is an advantage. The underdog always has an advantage, unless he's truly an underdog. <laughs> That's the only advantage sometimes you have is surprise. But if you're not very good, um, you're going to get beat anyway. Or Robert. Um, yeah, that was probably an advantage up to a point. Um, all right, that's one. Um, oh, depends on how I word this. Um, uh, is it a motivation? Is it a result? They're two different questions. So why do people go to war? What are the motivations? What are the uh, reasons in Henry V that people go to war, give me one. Um, oh, well, he, want, he wanted to be like the king of France or have more leadership over them. Right, so uh, you could say greed for land and power is certainly a motivation for fighting, yes. Um, and this one, they claim the throne like an ancestry and also he was the king of himself was by the French, so. Okay. And, and it depends on how I ask the question. What I'm probably going to be asking you is what broad reasons that just it's not just true for Henry, but it would be true for a lot of wars. Can you think of another one online? Uh, well, I was going to say that French troops, uh, they didn't want the French troops to be attacked. Yeah. So profit is a reason for war. The bishops are an example of that. Who else is an example of that? Uh, Henry the old friends. Bardolf, Nim, and Pistol. And Pistol, even at the end, he's still trying to make money off of war. He's going to go back to England and claim he was a hero. Um, so the question is, what do you what do you learn about war? Um, it's costly. Look how many people die. Henry loses two of his cousins. The French lose. 8,000 odd number, but eight, around 8,000 um, of their best troops. And let's see, uh, plays. Uh, don't forget, we did this yesterday the interaction between classes and nationality. So you would need to give examples of all of that. Yeah. Oh, you asking? Well, if anybody needs to hear that again. Yes. Oh, wait, what's the difference between, like, or the interaction between classes? All right. Sarah? The nobleman uh, spoke in verse, and the, and the commonman spoke in prose. Right, and that's throughout the play, particularly when Henry interacts with them. He can switch. He can go to, he can go to prose when he's somehow talking to the king of France, or he can go to poetry. Uh, that, he can go to poetry with the king, and go to prose with Llewellyn and all, uh, Llewellyn and all those guys. Um, think about Alice and uh, Catherine. Uh, Noble, someday to be queen, and a common, um, common. Uh, Henry and his three buddies, although he never interacts with them, um, he does interact with Williams, Bates, and and um, the other guy, Court. So he he interacts with. So just be able to point. Of course, between nationality, that's pretty obvious. The French. Um, what's going first? All right, and one more thing. Don't forget the four. Or five, four of the officers, Welsh, Scot, Irish, and English, they have to interact with each other. They don't get along. But Morris and Flewellyn don't get along. So all those are examples. And you mentioned blank verse. Anybody know what to blank verse? Uh, underlined by the entire play, all 38 plays, are primarily written in blank verse. Um, when you read Paradise Lost, next year, Dr. Vessel is written in blank verse. It's very versatile and useful. For poets, yes. So we got this done here. All right. All right. Um, so let's just review this. That's it. Let me just show what we. Unless you have another question. Oh, I was just gonna say um, for like William, for those common soldiers, is like the only thing they have to know, like basically that they're just like common soldiers and just kind of serve as like the opposite of like the officers and like the higher class soldiers. Well, don't forget that they each have a specific role, like Williams has a particular role in it, uh, Flewellyn has a particular role, but even the common soldiers, Nim, Pistol, and Bardolph, have specific roles. But you're right in general, but just know that you know, each, com each soldier has a you know, different purpose. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. I'm just looking at a test I've used before. Um, it's um, pretty much what we've talked about. So, any last questions about it? I can't think of anything that in the last couple of days we had to cover. Um, I have paper, so you're going to have to write something before you go and put it in it. Uh, in the test. So I give you the next six minutes. Uh, some of you guys will use that to, uh, to study. Um, I would hope that some of you would do that. So you may begin. Any last questions, you're welcome to ask me.